योगेन चित्तस्य पदेन वाचाम मलम शरीरस्य च वैद्यकेना योपाकरोतम प्रवरम मुनीना पतंजलि प्राजलिरान तोस्मी आपाहुपुरुषाकार शंखचक्रासीधारिण सहस्रशिसम श्वेत प्रणमा पतंजलि श्रीमते अनंताय नागराजाय नमो नमः सो ग्रीटिंग्स फ्रेंड्स लास्ट वीक वी डिस्कस द सूत्रा नंबर ट्वेल्व अभ्यास वैराग्याभ्याम तन्निरोध हा एंड वी सो how patanjali is prescribing both abhyasa and vairagyam as the upayam for <coughs> reaching the state of chitta vritti nirodha in the next few sutras <coughs> patanjali would like to clarify what is abhyasam what is vairagyam so the next sutras is basically what we will call as abhyasa lakshanam what is the definition of abhyasa and what are its characteristics <clears throat> and this is what is presented in the next few sutras so we go to sutra number 13 which is presenting the definition of abhyasam tatra sthitau yatnah abhyasah <clears throat> so patanjali is saying that abhyasa is that which takes us to that state of chitta vritti nirodha and stay there the word tatra tatra means there so when we say there the question can be asked where <coughs> where is this there so patanjali says there infers chitta vritti nirodha or as some of the commentator says sampragnyata samadhi sthiti the state of sampragnyata samadhi sthiti <coughs> means the state of samadhi so yatnah means the effort <coughs> sthiti sthitau means that which keeps us steady there so in a simple way the sutra is defined defining abhyasa as the effort that keeps us steady in the state of chitta vritti nirodha or <coughs> that which keeps us steady in the state of sampragnyata samadhi now we have to understand this sutra a bit more <clears throat> when we say that you have to remain steady in a position for example somebody tells you you have to become the chief of this company and you have to remain steady in this position as the chief of the company you have to remain steady there it also includes the effort to reach that state of being the chief of the company it's not just to stay there so it's not only that you have to take some efforts to reach the goal but you also have to take the efforts to remain there but patanjali by presenting that you have to take the effort to remain there also includes that it the effort to reach there when we say sthiti it is not only sthiti of chitta vritti nirodha it is also the prapti of chitta vritti nirodha what is going to help us reach the state of chitta vritti nirodha because we cannot remain steady <coughs> somewhere until we have reached that state but patanjali is very intelligent when he says you have to remain steady there it means the more important thing in the process of yoga sadhana is that you are not only reaching a goal but you are remaining in that goal 
very often it is easy for us to take some effort to achieve something but it is very difficult to sustain that achievement <clears throat> for example recently we have had the situation where we have the world cup cricket and india was the champions last time we have achieved that state last time in 2011 now we have to sustain that state and that has not been possible because we have lost the semi finals this few days ago so we have not sustained that state we are no more the world champions so achieving a goal is not enough what is more important is to sustain that achievement this is because sometimes it is very <clears throat> possible that we take some efforts and we reach the state of chitta vritti nirodha we remain focused for some amount of time for some duration of time but then we get distracted and we fall so we are not able to sustain it and that is why patanjali says practice is not only <clears throat> the state where you reach the goal but you remain there in the hatha yoga pradipika also in the commentary especially they talk about this idea actually the commentator says it is relatively easier to reach the state of samadhi or raja yoga as he calls it but it is more difficult to sustain that state compared to reaching and sustaining according to these acharyas sustaining the state of chitta vritti nirodha is more difficult than just reaching there it's possible for us sometimes we can take some effort to remain focused for a certain narrow period of time for one day two days maybe a week we go to a retreat in the himalayas there is no distractions it is very quiet and there is <clears throat> very healthy food there is healthy air the air is fresh so maybe we are able to sustain it for one week we remain calm quiet but then we have to come back to our household we come to chennai land in the airport traffic jam starts we get agitated then 400 phone calls come from family and friends where were you what were you doing what happened this is pending that is missing this is happening we get agitated immediately that means we have fallen from that state of quietness so that is why patanjali says tatra sthitaha sthita means to remain there that is what our effort should be about yatnaha the effort must be towards sustaining that state so there comes certain discussions yatnam means effort but it does not mean any effort that's why in the second chapter patanjali clarifies because he uses the word prayatnam means appropriate practice you have to put the appropriate practice to reach the goal for example you want to climb the himalaya mountains you need to put practices where you are able to walk for long duration of time you are able to manage with low levels of oxygen at the height your health must be in good condition etc etc you have to have good shoes etc but if that is not your goal if your goal is to go swimming across the english channel you don't need the same effort you need different kind of an effort so depending on the goal the effort must be appropriate but not only that depending on the person the effort should be appropriate because each one of us we have certain strengths and certain weaknesses certain things some people already may have a predisposition for some people need to put some effort to develop that skill so prayatnam is effort that is appropriate both consistent with the context of the goal as well as consistent with that capacity of the person so 
that is the right effort because as you are progressing in the path of yoga the effort will have to keep changing because we are not static persons we are changing all the time today when we are beginners one level of effort is needed one kind of effort is needed then you become an intermediate level practitioner you are closer to the goal another level of effort another kind of effort is necessary advanced when you become an advanced practitioner the practices are becoming more smooth more spontaneous so another level of effort is needed so that is why the effort has to be dynamic even though the goal is steady tatra sthitau refers to to be steady in the state of chitta vritti nirodha to not be steady in only the same practice throughout your life sometimes we take certain things literally we say oh teacher has given the practice maybe we met the teacher when we were 15 years old and the teacher gives one practice and we stay with that practice for the rest of our life that is not possible because our body is changing our capacities are changing so the practice has to be made appropriate even if the goal is the same because as persons we are changing we are evolving we are not the same what is possible 10 years ago is not possible today which in another 10 years will not be possible but to have a steadiness of the mind to have the calmness of the mind that goal may remain the same that does not necessarily have to change so the goal may remain the same but the efforts may have to be appropriate so that is what is the con concept of yatna appropriate effort but there is also other meanings for the word yatnam the word yatna also means according to krishna macharya prana yatna this is very very significant the effort must be in such a way that it should be consistent with the breathing capacity of the person see we all know that breath and mind are related very strongly to each other hate yoga pradipika says chale vate chalam chittam if the mind is <clears throat> if the breath is moving very fast mind is agitated if the breath is moving slow mind is very calm so when we say chitta vritti nirodha that the mind is becoming more calm it also implies that breathing will become calm it's implied it is not necessarily stated but it is implied because when the mind is quiet the breathing is quiet so when we take the effort to go to a state of chitta vritti nirodha where we are hoping that the mind is going to be calm it is very natural and logical for us to assume that the breath will also be calm so when we put the effort to practice if we are practicing with no regard or respect to our breathing we ignore the breathing we push the breathing then the breath will get disturbed through the practice chitta vritti nirodha will not be possible because during your practice you are pushing yourself very hard you are forcing yourself you are pushing your beyond your capacity breath will get disturbed when the breath is getting disturbed how can the mind be calm so that is why krishna macharya's definition was always that when you are defining practice towards chitta vritti nirodha it should always be consistent with breathing capacity it should be consistent with the breathing capacity where the breathing is dirgha and sukshma long and smooth because only when the breathing is long and smooth the breath is quiet the mind will also be quiet so when we are doing asana pranayama meditation mantra etc if we are doing it in a manner that makes the breathing very calm very quiet chitta vritti nirodha is nearer 
Whereas when we do a practice where we are pushing our body so much that the breath is getting agitated, Chitta Vritti Nirodha goes further away. So that's why it's illogical to just do any practice just because we have to practice that is not appropriate to the breathing. Some people go to gym and they are pushing and pumping and you can see their breathing is gasping. Some people do asanas as if it is a circus and they are jumping from one to the other and they are doing it so fast. Some people do pranayama very fast. According to Krishnamacharya and other acharyas like that, even according to Patanjali, the definition of abhyasa is this will not take you closer to Chitta Vritti Nirodha, it will only take you further away. So it's better not to practice this way then practice it this way. It's better not to practice at all compared to this. <clears throat> I used to have a professor in the university and sometimes as students we would do some homework. He would give us some homework and we would just do some things. We were a bit lazy. We would do something and bring it to him. No. <clears throat> and sometimes he would be so agitated because the homework would be so horrible. And we would say to him, sir, something is better than nothing. And his response, he was a very perfect teacher. His response was, something is better than nothing, I don't agree. Nothing is better than nonsense. So the same way, rather than doing <coughs> some nonsense that is not respecting the breathing, it's better not to do that. Because that is not Tatra sthitau yatnaha abhyasa. It is not going to be a practice that is appropriate. So, sometimes we have to reevaluate our practices. It is not a criticism towards people who are practicing this way, but rather <clears throat> in suggesting this way, my goal is that we bring awareness to the way we are practicing so that we are closer to the teachings of Patanjali rather than further away. Many times, Students around the world practice in an inappropriate way because of ignorance. They are not educated by their teachers. Perhaps their teachers themselves were not educated by their teachers because the teachings of Patanjali may not have been clearly understood. So by talking about these things, it is a way in which we are trying to bring back the attention to the principal essence of Patanjali's teachings because we need to make sure that the reason we are practicing has some value that takes us closer to the yoga states. So that is why acharyas like Krishnamacharya, they define yatna as prana yatna, effort that is consistent with the prana, with the breathing. Another definition that acharya Krishnamacharya gives as yatna is atma yatna. Atma yatna, effort is defined as Atma yatna. Literally translated Atma means our consciousness. But in this context, you can call this as the conscience, the heart. See, there are two ways of doing practice. We can do practice mechanically. Body has the extraordinary skill to learn things. For example, we can do asana, watching TV. There are a lot of people who are doing <coughs> some mantras when they are cooking, when they are watching TV, mantra japa is happening in the hand, World Cup cricket is going on the TV. We can do it mechanically because the body has the capacity to learn, the mind has the capacity to learn. But is that a conscious effort? If we do practice mechanically, there is a disconnection. There is a disconnection from body, breath and spirit, atma. Body, breath and spirit. There is a disconnection. But the word yoga is union, a connection. Yoga is a connection. That is why when we do it consciously, not mechanically, when we are practicing consciously, there is a union that happens with between body, breath, mind and spirit, all of them come together and that is what 
is the essence of yoga. Yoga is the process of connection. It is not the process of disconnection. So another meaning for yatnam, which comes from the concept of atma yatnam, is essentially that we are doing the practice with some attention from our heart. We are doing it consciously rather than unconsciously, rather than mechanically. We can close our eyes and we can eat because our body has learned to coordinate hand to mouth. We don't have to be conscious. So many people watch TV and eat food. Many people, they are walking to work when they are eating food. Many people drive in the car and eat food. Are we eating consciously? No. It's mechanical. But you can also consciously eat. The same way asanas, pranayama, meditation, mantra. You can do mechanically all the procedures. Mind is so smart, so intelligent. It can learn. Patanjali later in the fourth chapter says, Tad asankhyeya vasanabihi chitramapi parartam sammatya karitvat. Tad asankhyeya vasanabihi chitramapi mind. It has so many vasanas, impressions and picture, images. And therefore it can operate on its own. It doesn't have to be connected to the conscience. It can operate on its own. But still, it cannot do that because it is meant to serve the other. Parartham. It is, its main function is to serve the conscious. So that's why Acharyas like Vishnamacharya also say, when you do practice, that practice that will take you closer to Chittavritti Nirodha is practices that come from the conscience, the conscious part of yourself, not the mechanical part. So remember my friends, when you do practices, whether it is asana practice, pranayama practice, mantra practice, ahara or vihara, lifestyle practices or dietary practices, all the practices must come from a conscious place not an unconscious place and this is very very important attribute or quality for practice so this is another dimension of what is the meaning of yatna effort then comes the word abhyasaha abhyasaha is also a very interesting word because abhyasa is very related with one word which is called ayasam Ayasam means that you are you are putting effort in such a way that you become tired. In uh, Hatha Yoga Pradipika, for example, they say that one of the things that will destroy yoga, quality of yoga, is if we practice in such a way that we are tired. At the end of yoga practice, one must not be tired. The one must feel refreshed, one must feel light. Anga Lagavam, the body should feel light, the body should not feel exhausted. When you do the practice consciously and with attention and respect to the breathing, you will not get tired, you will only get rejuvenated, you will feel lighter. So this is another important principle to remember, the word Abhyasa itself means that you, you are not tired when you are practicing. Practice should not make one tired. And that's why when you look at it, when you are practicing asana or pranayama, etc., and you become tired, you have to reevaluate that practice. And that is where prayatnam comes, appropriate practice. You must do practice that is appropriate to your capacities. There is also another definition of abhyasa that is coming from bodhayana. Arambaram samshiranam punaha punaha abhyasaha arambaram samshilanam punaha punaha abhyasaha what is practice you begin arambanam you begin to put some effort but don't just put some effort also check samshilanam quality control check if this practice is good for you for example, we are having a manufacturing unit, we are getting an order for 
1 million products to be made. Now, it is not just that you get one product right and then you just make the factory run. You have to do quality check at intermittent times, maybe after you do the first batch of 1000, you check, then it is okay, you make another batch of maybe 10,000 and you check, the quality inspector will check and then even after you are, as you are producing, you are checking and you are refining, checking and you are refining. That is what is the meaning of arambanam samshilanam punaha punaha abhyasa. You begin, you check and you begin again. Arambanam punaha punaha samshilanam punaha punaha. You begin again and again. You check again and again. So today you are practicing. You do it for a few days and then you check. When you have checked and you see, okay, this practice has helped me in this way. This practice has not helped me in this way. So we have to refine the practice, make some modifications and begin again. Practice that for a few days. Check once again. Begin again. Make modifications, begin again. Now, normally, in the old days, this checking of the practice and modification of the practice was usually done by Acharya. The teacher would give the practice. You have to do the practice in your house for a few days, then you will come back. The teacher will observe you practicing. He will check whether you are doing the practice correctly. Then he, will, he or she will suggest some modifications. And then say, okay, do this practice again for one more week or two more weeks. Come back and they will check again and then they will begin again. Until the practice is becoming more and more closer to the goal. So that is what is the meaning of arambanam samshilanam punaha punaha. Now once you do this, you can never be mechanical in your practice. Because if you have to check again and again how the practice is doing, you have to check again and again every day. And even within the same practice, you have to check again and again because maybe your teacher is telling, do this asana 12 times. Or stay in this asana for 12 breaths. Every time you do, you have to check, are you doing it correctly? What is happening in the body? Now the moment you check again and again each time, how can you be disconnected from the practice? Similarly, when you have to stay there for 12 breaths and the tea, you are checking every breath, if it's the same duration as the previous breath or is it getting longer, is it getting smoother? How can you be disconnected from the practice? Your mind and heart must be so connected to the practice. So that is why this definition also is very important definition of Abhyasa which is Arambanam samshilanam punaha punaha abhyasaha. It's a very important definition of practice. So, this is yet another dimension that is coming here. Shankara says about abhyasa, yama niyamadi ashtanga yoga sadhanani. Shankara says that what is the meaning of abhyasa? is the sadhana such as yama, niyama and others, which means yama, niyama, asana, pranayama, pratyahara, dharana, dhyanam and samadhi. We have to put that into practice. That is what is abhyasam and that is what will take us closer to the state of chitta vritti nirodha and this is also very important. I would like to say one clarification about this. Because many of us we believe in the field of yoga that if you do some asanas for one or two hours a day, we are practicing yoga and we are going closer to samadhi. This is an incorrect understanding of Patanjali's teachings. Patanjali in the second chapter makes it very, very clear, yoga anga anushthanat. You have to practice all the angas of yoga. When you practice all the angas of yoga, which includes all the eight limbs, then you may get what is called Viveka. Now, even Viveka is not the end. 
Viveka must be sustained, it becomes the upayam, the means for kaivalyam. So, there is two step program here. It is not just enough to just do some asanas and pranayama two hours a day and do nothing else. We have to do all the ashtanga yoga, yama niyama, which means the way we live with people, with ourselves. Then sensory control, sensory discipline, which includes vairagyam, detachment. Then asana, pranayama, etc. Then comes dhyanam, dharana, etc., which involves maybe mantras, bhavanas, nyasas, etc., the other tools. And that is why yoga sadhana is called sarvanga sadhana. It is a practice that is inclusive of all the angas. It is not what is called anga bhanga sadhana. Anga bhanga sadhana means practices that are limited to certain parts of the body. Like for example, you do physical exercises, it only is mainly focused on physical exercises, nothing else. If you go to a gym, the gym teacher is not going to tell you how you can be a better person, how you can be speak the truth. Maybe an extraordinary gym teacher, yes, but in general his job is not that. His job is to teach you how to work on your muscles, how to keep your physical fitness. Mental emotional fitness, that is not the job of the gym teacher. Maybe you have to go to somebody else for that life coach. But the life coach will teach you how to live life, but he will not necessarily tell you how to be physically fit. Whereas yoga sadhanas is a sarvanga sadhana. All of this have to be put together into practice. When you do that, perhaps you will get what is called viveka. Viveka is clarity, discriminative knowledge the highest form of clarity. Now, that clarity is also not the end. Once you have the clarity, you live with that clarity, you sustain that clarity, then you are closer to spiritual freedom from suffering. It is not just enough if you know clearly that you are not suffering. Sometimes we know something very clearly, but we are still suffering. For example, when you buy a cigarette box, it very clearly says smoking is dangerous to health. We are absolutely clear about it. There is no doubt about that. It is proved by research, it is even proved by our own experience. We have clarity on this regard. But still, we are not, not suffering from that clarity. That clarity has not become part of our lifestyle. That clarity has not become the guiding parameter of our life. So, that is why sadhana in yoga has two steps. One step is to go closer to clarity and the second step is to make that clarity the dominant force in guiding our life. Then we are free from suffering. That is why Shankara says the first step in Abhyasa is to have Chitta Vritti Nirodha because Chitta Vritti Nirodha is the one that can give us clarity. That is why the sutras do not end with the first chapter. At the end of the first chapter already samadhi is described. But just because you have samadhi experience, it does not mean you are free from suffering. You have to sustain that state in such a manner that it becomes part of your lifestyle, becomes part of your daily living. And that is the next stage. But before that becomes, we have to first establish a clarity in us, otherwise we are living on the foundation of wrong knowledge and that is why we need this abhyasa so that we are closer to clarity because it is chitta vritti nirodha that can lead us to a state of clarity. So, that is why Patanjali defines this sutra tatra sthitav yatnaha abhyasaha that practice is that practice that will take us closer to chitta vritti nirodha and sustain that. Now, you understand because there is a two step process. One is to have clarity, second to sustain that clarity. Otherwise, we are not closer to the goal of yoga, which is to be free from suffering. And therefore, it is very imperative that we are establishing the appropriate means of practice. Please remember this, my friends. Do not assume that something is better than nothing. Because in reality, nothing is better than nonsense.